no, no habíamos querido decir nada antes de chequear bien lo que estaba sucediendo porque compromete a personas September 3rd, 2011. The Chilean news station TVN is hosting a live game show called KA7, or 7th Street, in which young adults compete in a series of challenges to avoid being eliminated, with the winner going on to eventually earn a cash prize. In Chile, the show was considered a success during its run, though it was never anything too out of the ordinary, especially as far as game shows go. And many familiar with it would probably be surprised to see it discussed in a video like this, as its family-friendly setup made it the last place you would ever expect to encounter a dark TV moment. And for most of its run, this was true. Except for that fateful September day. As the participants were engaging in a heated competition, the host, Jean Philippe, unexpectedly halts the program in the middle of a game with breaking news that a terrible, terrible accident had occurred, though not one on the show, but instead within the network itself. That morning, a team of workers from the TVN station, including famed presenters Felipe Camaroga and Roberto Bruce, along with numerous staff, had boarded a military aircraft to document the recovery efforts after the 2010 earthquake which had ravaged the country, with the plane heading for the island of Robinson Caruso, a destination that they would sadly never reach. As Jean Philippe would interrupt Calle 7 to share the devastating news that the plane had crashed into the ocean and that everyone aboard had likely been killed instantly, including the entire team that TVN had sent and some of the network's most prominent presenters. The news sent shockwaves across the entire country and especially the TVN network, with the on air team having to report that their close friends and colleagues had tragically passed away. And over the course of the following days, numerous bodies would be found floating near the crash site, along with debris and, eventually, the craft itself. It was said that the flight had encountered heavy winds upon reaching their destination, leading to two failed landing attempts. And while making a large U-turn to try their third landing attempt, the flight would disappear into the water, likely as a result of the craft running out of fuel. The interruption of the television program was and is considered a truly grim moment in the world of television, but the situation only gets more eerie as, upon searching the wreckage, divers would discover that the network's cameraman had been filming minutes before the crash, getting shots of each and every person aboard, all of whom were clueless to the fact that in just a few minutes' time, they would all be dead. It's unexplainably haunting watching a group of people unknowingly experiencing their final moments on this earth. But evidently, this footage wasn't the only morbid discovery. Within one of the camera's SD cards was a curious set of six images. Images that, at a glance, are not directly discernible. But once some effects are applied, start to become a bit more clear. As in the most infamous example, we see what appears to be a plain window, along with a large amount of water covering the lens, with the image being timestamped after the plane had impacted the water. And to make things even stranger, the SD card that was storing these images was allegedly found inside an empty water bottle. And though, to my knowledge, it has never been proven, these images introduced the idea that, at the very least, the cameraman, Romina Irazabel, was alive and even conscious after the crash, and snapped the pictures before placing the SD card in the water bottle in order to save them from corrupting in the salt water, which would also mean that he was alive and trapped aboard the broken vessel as it slowly sank to the bottom of the ocean, drowning with no hope of escaping the wreckage. To this day, the broadcast interruption, the footage, and the haunting unexplained final images cultivate into what can only be described as one of the darkest moments 
in TV history. I this is unbelievable. We don't know what has just happened right there. All across my channel is endless proof that the internet can be a dark, unforgiving place. And unfortunately, it's become far too easy for data brokers to find our personal information, like our full legal names, personal emails, home addresses, and even our relatives. And if you don't believe me, try Googling yourself, and you'll probably see all sorts of information that you likely had no idea was just out there in the open. And as someone like myself who has been negatively affected by the availability of this information, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to once again be sponsored by Aura, a company dedicated to helping our private information stay private. Aura uses their advanced technology to identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submitting opt-out requests on your behalf, which extends to junk mail and of course everyone's least favorite, telemarketing lists. On top of this, Aura monitors your emails and passwords to assure your information hasn't been involved in any sort of data breaches, even going as far as to search the dark web to see if any of your information may have ended up there. This way you can change your passwords to better protect yourself from hackers, as well as taking a series of other steps to help reclaim your information. So if this sounds like something that might be interesting to you, you can either keep letting people profit and exploit your private information, or you can go to aura.com slash Nick Crowley to start your free two week trial. They're probably just going to let going this thing into a parking lot. lay out. Stop. We'll yeah, see what happens here. He further. has stopped. This may be the end of this thing. We have one helicopter that is no more than oh, 0300 to 200 feet above this white Bronco that O.J. Simpson is in at this time. There's something inherently captivating about watching a live police chase or standoff. Perhaps it's the danger of it all, the feeling that at any moment, anything can happen, as you sit there watching it all unfold with no way of knowing how it'll end. Now, some of these turn out to have comedic finales, going on to gain notoriety for just how outrageous they are. This is like a comfortable stroll that this guy's just taken through the neighborhood. Somebody, you know, making the decision said, just let this guy go. While others conclude in complete disaster. Luckily, not a lot of people are just, wow, just missing those cars into oh, that power oh, line oh, wow. there. Wow, okay. and that is quite the, uh, the ending to this pursuit. And throughout the history of televised police chases and police standoffs, certain moments have left viewers shocked and traumatized by their abruptly disturbing endings. With one of the most recognized examples coming from all the way back in 1998, in the world's capital for this type of content. <laughs> This is Today in LA, first edition, with Carla Abago. It happened on April 30th at approximately 3 p.m., when residents in LA had their evening programming interrupted by breaking news. A standoff of sorts had been developing on the Harbor Freeway, one in which numerous stations, even those showing children's cartoons, would cut to. And glued to their screens, adults and children alike would watch as 40-year-old Daniel V. Jones would exit his vehicle and display a homemade banner that read, HMOs are in it for the money, live free, love safe, or die. Which was neatly placed on the ground as if he knew helicopters would be arriving to capture this unfolding dilemma. Daniel had been sick with cancer for some time and had just recently been diagnosed with HIV, something that he only blamed himself for. However, these illnesses led to a growing disdain for HMOs, or health maintenance organizations, and he would express his displeasure for them in a phone call to 911 at the very beginning of the incident. During the call, he relayed how he believed the organizations valued profits over the lives of him and countless others, and he wanted to expose them and all their harmful practices in front of the entire world. And now, he had his audience. So, with the whole world watching, Daniel entered his truck with his dog Gladys, lit a Molotov cocktail, and ignited a fire inside the vehicle, all while the broadcast stayed riveted on him. The scene was absolutely brutal, but it got even worse as he eventually exited the car, still on fire and now badly burned. And despite knowing that Daniel clearly had the intention of ending his life, the cameras just kept on rolling, and they continued to roll even as he brandished a shotgun and followed through on his ultimate desire as his life came to a gruesome end. All the while, thousands of children at home who were just trying to see their favorite cartoons watched on. 
The incident became a PR nightmare for the multiple stations that were live on the scene and seriously called into question the morality of broadcasting incidents of this nature. But it seems that the ratings they received were just too good to ever stray away from the practice. In fact, if anything, this incident probably boosted their intrigue, as it was the ultimate example that anything can happen on live TV. And yes, despite the tragic result and its human toll, this incident ultimately gave rise to even more broadcasts of this nature that are still to this day a commonplace, with one in particular leaving a lasting impact on myself for nearly a decade now. It started the same as any other live police chase, with multiple stations interrupting their broadcast with that classic flashing breaking news text. It was the 27th of July, 2007 in Phoenix, Arizona, where we're thrust into the action of a high-speed chase occurring at roughly 12.30 p.m. According to the broadcast, this white pickup truck had crashed into a police cruiser upon being pulled over and took off for unknown reasons, prompting not only a hefty response by local police, but local news stations as well, as after only a few minutes, news helicopters were already in the sky, streaming the whole situation out to the world. At some point in this chase, police were able to use a spike strip and seemingly shred all the tires from the man's truck, prompting him to slow down drastically and eventually bring his car to a complete stop. And uh, it looks like they're probably just going now to let going this thing into a play lot. out. We'll stop. We'll yeah, see what happens go here. Much he further. has stopped. This may be the end of this thing. This led to the cameras in the sky scrambling to get that perfect shot as the dramatic finale of this chase was growing ever so close though no one could have imagined the tragic end that this was all headed for. Well, he's taking okay, off he's running. Okay, now it's a foot chase. Okay, now he's jumped into now he's another, in another vehicle. vehicle. Okay, okay. All right, they're Doors closing in. Looks okay. like they've... Oh, we're we're going to pull out. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't know what has just happened right there. It looks like the police have closed in on him. We don't know... Uh, what exactly has transpired between the police. As the camera is fixed in on the action, we see a brief moment of static before the broadcast cuts back to the studio, followed by a hurried commercial break as confusion seems to fill the set, leaving the audience baffled at how they could pull away from the footage at such a tense, important moment, causing many to change the channel in a hurry to see just how this thing would end, which is where many would be faced with the reality of what exactly they had just witnessed. Uh, he commandeered another car. Wait, 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 wait. I got a problem here. Okay. I got an accident. Go north. Go north. I got a helicopter down. Oh, no. Connie is telling down. us she has a helicopter down. I... Oh, no, Connie. This is unbelievable. All right. Well, we're, we're going to leave that pursuit and find out. Oh, this is miserable. This is... This is unbelievable. Okay. Connie, uh, can you tell us? Are you getting chatter? You would know more than us right now. At this moment, while KNVX-TV's helicopter, piloted by Craig Smith, along with cameraman Rick Krolak, was capturing the action, a separate helicopter, piloted by Scott Bowerbank, and cameraman Jim Cox from the KTVK station, had been unknowingly heading directly towards them. And with all four men blinded by their obligation to capture this chase in real time, the two aircrafts would unexpectedly collide, leading to the freefall of both helicopters and the deaths of all four aboard. The footage was captured by both parties involved and shown live to who knows how many people, with both providing equally chilling moments, like in the original KNVX TV broadcast, where you can hear the faint yelling of one of the men on board. Well, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't know what has just happened right there. It looks like the police and in the KTVK helicopter, when Jim Cox says the line, Now he's hitting eastbound and he just hit some more barricades. Absolutely unbelievable. This guy doesn't care what he hits. When in reality, the very craft he was in was mere moments away from barreling straight into the other news chopper. The entire scene is certainly one of the darkest police chases ever recorded. And to me, what makes it all the more gut-wrenching is seeing the other news stations swarm to cover the crash with many of those people forced to cover the incident being acquaintances and even good friends with the people they had just watched perish, leading to some genuinely heartbreaking reactions. Holy crap! Oh no! Oh Jesus! Oh God! Oh my gosh! Hey, oh my God! Channel 15 and Channel 3 just had a mid-air collision. Just watch that whole thing. I'm good, I'm off your nose. I'm, I'll get back right. 
I think it was I think it was Scott. But the one thing I would request is please please leave my family alone. Nearly 18 years ago now, a strange phenomenon hit British tabloids as the papers began to report on a seemingly mundane man named Mick Philpot. As far as I could tell, he never seemed to go out of his way to acquire this fame, but rather the lifestyle he lived caused it to occur organically, and for all the wrong reasons. The then nearly 50-year-old man had recently become a father of 15, with the children split up between five different women, two of which he took turns living with in a sort of love triangle situation. And if the living arrangements and the sheer number of kids wasn't intriguing enough, he further gained infamy thanks in large part due to his attitude on working, as he refused to get a job and instead would allegedly scheme his way into getting exponential amounts of government benefits. And he did so all the while his pregnant wife and his pregnant girlfriend carried out full-time jobs. It's easy to find their living arrangements strange and maybe even a bit comical, but behind it all was actually a very legitimate dark side, as Mick had a habit of finding young, vulnerable girls to essentially groom and impregnate. His now wife, Mareed, was just 18 years old at the time they began dating, and she was one of the older ones, as when he was 37, he struck up a relationship with a 14-year-old girl, who eventually ran away with him at the age of 16. And this dark side of his gets worse when it's revealed that he was also a notorious domestic abuser, slapping and violently beating his past partners on numerous occasions including one instance when he stabbed his ex-girlfriend 12 times, before then turning the knife on her mother who attempted to step in and help. His reason for doing this? Well, he didn't like that she spent so much time watching over a baby she was caring for. Thankfully, despite the traumatic injuries, the mother and daughter would survive the attack and go on to live normal lives. And because of this assault, Mick would receive the staggering prison sentence of seven years. And by the 80s, he was a free man, continuing his nefarious activities all the while. For lack of a better word, Mick was a menace, who somehow was not only a free man after all the crimes he committed, but was also having his entire life funded by the very government that should have locked him away for so much longer. And with his name now in the press, mainly for his number of children, he would use his platform to complain that the benefits he received weren't enough, and that he wanted even more. This caused an even bigger stir in the tabloids, and it was only a matter of time before someone called him up to appear on TV, with Mick and his two lovers eventually being invited onto the Jeremy Kyle show, where Mick's temper would be put on full display. You had a go at me. I said your kids, when they came here today, were well-behaved and well-mannered and well-groomed. No newspaper said that, so you should be apologizing to I... me, because I hadn't even started on you. Listen, you want to start? You start! Oh. You start! Oh. Do you Eventually, Mick would settle down and his wife, Mareed, and girlfriend, Lisa Willis, were brought out to discuss their relationship further, to which the two surprisingly seemed very content, not backing down from their stance that there was nothing wrong with their feelings towards Mick. Do you not get slightly peeved that she is Mrs. Mick and your mistress, Mick? No. I'm being serious. <laughs> Don't bother me one bit. Ending the program off on a surprising note for the host, who likely expected some sort of reaction from the pair, even getting frustrated to the point where he would lambast the girls for their laissez-faire attitude. Where is your dignity? You're 22. Don't you want a bloke to yourself? He just said, I agree with you. When you grew up, did you think you were going to share your bloke with a, another woman? I didn't actually know. But two mums is better for all the kids. Or confusing. No. And as the show came to an end, so too did Mick's 15 minutes of fame, as the paper slowly began to find their next target, and the world continued on with Mick, his 15 kids, and multiple lovers out of mind. Until the year 2012, when his name would pop up once again for a much different reason. Yeah, 
On May 12, 2012, Mick's home would catch on fire in the dead of night while he, his wife Marie, and their many children were sleeping peacefully. In the panic, the couple managed to escape with some of their kids, but tragically, six of them, all of whom were below the age of 10, would pass away in the blaze, having been stuck upstairs and inaccessible to any form of rescue. By the 16th of May, the story had reached far and wide of the tragedy that unfolded, with Mick and Marie garnering widespread community support. Locals in the area would even band together and raise the money for the children's funeral, prompting the emotional pair to give a heartfelt thank you through the media. I've actually been down to my, our, our home, and what we saw, we just, we just cannot believe it. <laughs> to see this community to, to come together like the have, it's just, it's just too overwhelming. But there's one thing I would request is please, please leave my family alone. <laughs> if you've got any questions or anything at all, please don't come through me or my family. Please go to the police. And for many, this would have likely been the last they'd ever hear of this broken family, had it not been for a single discovery found within the home's debris. While sifting through the burnt remains of the house, police would discover gasoline in the mailbox, which when found at crime scenes is typically associated with arson. And coincidentally, the very morning of the fire, Mick just so happened to have a court hearing to obtain custody over he and Lisa Willis's children, the second woman who had appeared with Mick on the Jeremy Kyle show. Given that the general public had immediately stopped caring about this family after their appearance on TV, not many knew that Mick and Lisa had actually split up in the following years and were in the midst of a bitter custody dispute, leading to speculation that Lisa may have intentionally set Mick's home on fire as some sort of vindictive act. Or at least, that's what Mick wanted us to believe. What you said, tell me what you said to me. What you said about me trying to get in. I tried everything you could to get in that because I told him I wanted to run through the flames, not the stairs. What did you cry when you were saying it? How bad? Not really, really bad, but I did cry. That's so cool. With a fingerprint on the window. And that's it. <laughs> a few discrepancies. That's all it is. It's my fault that the family's gone. Upon doing an in-depth investigation, which included bugging a hotel room that Mick and Marie were staying in, police would eventually capture a verbal confession that proved the married couple had actually been the ones to initially set the fire, along with their friend Paul Mosley. But why? Well, their goal wasn't actually to kill the children. It was instead to save them. In reality, they had planned on setting the fire in a way that Mick and Marie could swoop in at the last minute and save all the kids, as a way of making them appear as heroes, before going on to pin the fire on Lisa, and in turn having her arrested while they obtained custody of her children. It was an evil plan that was made so much worse when the fire spread too quickly, making the rescue of the children upstairs almost immediately impossible. And in his desperate attempt to gain even more children under his roof, Mick ended up killing six of his very own. It's particularly chilling watching the three of these people sitting in unison on that fateful program, none of whom knowing just how bitter things would turn, and how two of them would eventually become murderers, all in an attempt to frame the other. It's unspeakably dark. And thankfully this time, Mick Philpot will be kept in prison till the day he dies, exactly where he belongs. There are a lot of accusations and allegations about what's happening. I want to do something that is unthinkable. Please don't kill me. Our next case is by far the most requested topic that I have ever received on this channel, as it seems to strike a chord with so many who watch the situation unfold live. It all started on the evening of June 25th, 2007, the night in which the WWE had been preparing to air a live three-hour program known as Raw. The event was set to feature their usual star-studded list of wrestlers going head-to-head -head in Corpus Christi, Texas. Though the morning of, out of the group of those star wrestlers, one man was missing, Chris Benoit. According to fellow wrestler Chavo Guerrero, he had received a voicemail from Benoit two days prior, where he was told that Benoit's wife Nancy and son Daniel had come down with food poisoning 
before telling another coworker the following day that Nancy was so sick that she had been vomiting blood. Guerrero would go on to state that the following morning, he received vague text from Benoit, with some simply stating his address and another giving directions to where the dogs were being kept and how the side door to the house was left unlocked. Texts that were sent around 3 a.m. and ignored by Guerrero, as he knew he would be seeing Benoit in just a few hours, given that he was going to be picking him up at the airport in preparation for the show. Though he would never hear from Benoit again. Good evening. In reality, WWE superstar Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel are dead. With the program growing nearer on the 25th, news would be relayed to the WWE that Chris Benoit, along with Nancy and Daniel, had been found dead within their home. The news came as a shock to the entirely scheduled Raw event. The decision was made to cancel the matches and instead showcase a tribute to the famed wrestler who so suddenly lost his life. And so on the evening of June 25th, 2007, the WWE would reflect on some of Chris Benoit's best moments in the circuit along with their biggest stars giving personal accounts of just how much Benoit meant to them, with it all happening live and in real time the very night that Chris was found dead. Throughout the program, wrestlers like Stone Cold Steve Austin, John Cena, and CM Punk, who was originally scheduled to fight Benoit that night, shared heartfelt memories of just how good a man Chris Benoit truly was, emphasizing his talent, work ethic, and the love he had for his family. <coughs> It was respect. It meant everything to him. Respect for this business, respect for the fans, respect for the wrestlers, respect for his family, respect for himself. And for a moment, this all seemed to be exactly what the wrestling world needed, to bring everyone together in remembrance. But near the end, a shift seemed to occur following an interview given by William Regal, whose comments towards Benoit felt far more reserved than the others before him, who poured their hearts out over their fallen friend. At a later date, I'll be quite happy to sit here and tell you all the things about Chris Benoit that I'd like to tell you. Um, but now all I'm willing to say is that Chris Benoit was undoubtedly the hardest working man in professional wrestling. According to some watching the program, the interview did feel a bit out of place and apparently slightly threw off the vibe of the remaining show, as things felt far more stiff and reserved than at its opening. And there was good reason for this. When Regal was preparing to do this live interview, he was allegedly approached by fellow wrestler John Layfield, who pulled him aside and asked, you think he had anything to do with it? Initially, the thought had never even crossed his mind. In fact, he had a heartfelt message fully prepared to read in the moments leading to his interview but something about that question made him pause, leading to his subsequent words being rather short and cautious as the hesitation led to the creeping thought of, what if he really did have something to do with it? A thought that very few at the time had even considered, which looking back seems so surreal. As for those familiar with the case, you know exactly where this is headed. Uh, we are at now looking at this case and ruling it as a double homicide Suicide. Uh, evidence in the home leads us to believe that Mr. Benoit had murdered his wife uh, by asphyxiation. Uh, sometime shortly after that, uh, the same for his son, Daniel. Over the previous days before Chris's tribute was aired, he would be the one to take the lives of his wife, son, and eventually himself. Benoit did so by drugging and strangling his son and wife, while leaving Bibles by their side, seemingly as a result of some type of mental breakdown. To this day, an exact motive is still not fully understood, but it likely had to do with a combination of multiple factors, with the most glaring being the head trauma that Benoit had suffered as a result of his profession. As following his death, Benoit's brain was studied by a neurologist who would go on to state that, Benoit's brain was so severely damaged, it resembled the brain of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. The gruesome scene uncovered at the family home by the hands of Chris Benoit makes this whole memorial program for him just seem so much more chilling, as not even 24 hours later, the man that was being so highly praised as a loving family man would be revealed to have been the one behind his own family's murder. 
And as disturbing as this all is, there's plenty of other chilling moments left behind by Benoit, with perhaps none more eerie than the promo he shot for another Raw event just a few years before his death. My wife and my children will not be watching Raw because I am going to do something that is unthinkable. I'm going to leave you with my anger. Sleep well. July 7th, 2012. Television host Beto Ortiz opens up the very first episode of a brand new TV show called El Valor de la Verdad, or The Value of Truth. Throughout its airtime, the show would challenge contestants to answer a series of questions honestly while strapped to a polygraph test. The test then monitors if the person is telling the truth or not, and with each correct answer, you earn more and more money until you either choose not to answer a question or until you're caught lying. Though there was a catch. The questions would get increasingly more difficult and embarrassing, and all the while you're answering them, you're seated directly next to your loved ones, with whom the questions were often based around. The whole program is incredibly cringe-inducing, but in a way that you can't quite take your eyes off. And in Peru, the value of truth was poised to become a breakout hit thanks in large part to the success of this very first episode. In it, we're introduced to the contestant Ruth Thalia Sea Sanchez, a 19-year-old call center employee hoping to gain fame from the show while being accompanied by her parents and boyfriend Brian Romero Levea. And they could not have selected a better inaugural participant. Up until this point, Ruth had lived her life in a state of poverty, and the type of money offered by the program would be life-changing for both herself and her family, which might explain her openness on air, as throughout the entire program, Ruth answers each and every question with painful honesty. In one moment, she admits that she wishes that she were white, and in another, she stated how she was often embarrassed by her parents' manners, which she says as they sat directly across from her. You can feel the tension as each answer seems to drive a dagger into her parents' hearts, eventually leaving her mother in tears. And it only gets more painful from here as she was asked, are you with your crush until someone better arrives? To which she says, yes, with her boyfriend watching on just feet away. And following this, the questions would become more and more intrusive, with Ruth eventually having to admit that in order to pay her bills, she worked at a nightclub as a stripper, which was news to all of her loved ones who sat there stunned by the revelation, especially her boyfriend, Brian. A revelation that leads us to Ruth's final question and the most painful one of all. Have you ever accepted money in exchange for sex? A question which she would answer, yes before promptly ending her time on the show three questions away from the finale. Me retiro. Se retira. Me retiro. The whole ordeal left everyone, including the audience, completely stunned. On one hand, many applauded Ruth for being so honest, and on the other, she was criticized for putting her family and her boyfriend specifically through this embarrassing line of questions, broadcast for the whole country to see. The cringe-inducing episode became so popular that the station supposedly aired it each weekend for a staggering 12 weeks straight. The show and Ruth herself became instant phenomenons, and in a sense, this did bring Ruth some of the fame that she so desperately desired, making appearances on multiple news programs in the following weeks, and becoming a legitimate household name in Peru. And the finances helped her situation too, as she walked away with 15,000 souls, or about 5,800 US dollars back then. And for a moment, it seemed as if the pain of releasing all this private information might have actually been worth it until the day she vanished.
Out of nowhere, Ruth suddenly went radio silent, missing appointments and failing to answer her phone while her home sat vacant. For 10 days straight, there was no sign of the young star, prompting a massive search of the area she lived in, with those same loved ones that had accompanied her on the value of truth helping lead the search efforts. Until eventually, police would happen across her lifeless body, buried in a shallow grave. She had died of asphyxiation, a clear-cut case of murder. And there was only ever one suspect. Just before Ruth had vanished, she would make an appearance on TV in which she appeared lower energy than normal, expressing her sadness in the fact that her and her boyfriend Brian had broken up, likely as a result of the embarrassment brought about by the show. And with this in mind, Brian had been questioned about his role in her disappearance and eventually admit to everything. Angered by the embarrassment that Ruth had caused him in front of the entire nation, and feeling as if he was owed a certain percentage of the money that Ruth had earned, Brian would visit Ruth's home and drug her with sleeping pills before proceeding to assault her and eventually hang her. He would then bury her body in the hopes that she would never be found. Years later, Brian would be found guilty of Ruth's murder and receive the punishment of life in prison. Despite its very first episode leading to a prolific murder case, The Value of Truth remained a hit show for years to follow, until it would eventually fizzle out and be taken off the air, leaving in its wake a multitude of embarrassing memories and one of the darkest moments in TV history. <laughs>